are back on the zero hour. Uh, I haven't talked to my next guest in a while, uh, so I'm looking forward to speaking. Uh, you probably know his work. Thomas Frank is an author, a historian, commentator, and uh, his books include What's the Matter with Kansas, Listen Liberal, and his just released new book is The People, comma, No, N-O, A Brief History of Anti-Populism. So with that, Thomas Frank, uh, thanks for coming back on the program. You got it, Richard. I'm glad to be here. Excuse me, RJ. Well, we, I didn't want to give it away. I didn't want to give it away there. No, no, no. <laughs> you call me Richard. Call me RJ. Rick, Ricky, anything but Dick. Uh, and um, <laughs> let's... Uh, you, I'm sure by now, have a brief summary of your book. I hate it when, you know, someone else summarizes their book for them. So what are your well, thoughts? Well, I happen to know that you've read it, Richard. So uh, I, I indeed think you have. Carefully. Okay, so it's a, it's a, uh, there is all of this. Um, the problem is I talk too much, Richard. That's my problem. But there's all of these people out there who are writing about populism, hating populism, denouncing populism. And I decided to go back to the people who uh, invented the word. I mean, there really is an original case of populism and compare this modern day criticism of populism to that. Uh, that original populism was the word was invented about 20 miles from where I'm sitting right now in Kansas City. And um, the modern day sort of understanding of populism has almost nothing to to do with the original populist party, which was started here in Kansas and which was a sort of an attempt to make an American labor party uh, that brought together farmers and industrial workers in the 1890s. Uh, that uh, m movement, uh, it, it petered out after about a decade, but first it caused the establishment all kinds of terror. We'll talk about that in a minute. And my argument is that this true populist spirit survived on, even though the populist this party died. And you see it again in the 1930s. You see it again in the 1960s. But what is far more fascinating to me is the people who have hated populism, because there is an essential continuity between the people who hated populism here in Kansas in the 1890s uh, and then the people who hated the New Deal in the 1930s and then, the, you know, right up until the present day, these people who strongly distrust mass democracy and strongly distrust working class movements. There you go. Well, How's that? That's pretty good. And uh, I will say, having read the book, which uh, I, I loved, I really enjoyed, I encourage people to get it, and I don't always say that, um, I would also say that if anything, you understated the case of what to me was a striking continuity uh, uh, between what people were saying against populism or working class uh, you know movements in the 19th century and what they're saying what they were saying in the early 20th century and what they're saying now what struck me so much about it was that first of all it made me consider the idea that anti-populism is itself uh, a clear ideology with rhetorical habits or conventions or or go to uh, yes, phrases. You are exactly right. And, and, and by the way, the best way to show the people what we mean by this are those cartoons. Have you seen? Did I? Have you looked on my web? I put all the cartoons from the 1890s up on my website. These cartoons from the original anti-populist panic. There was this moment of incredible panic among the establishment in 1896, and uh, uh, they just went. Um, it was hysteria. I call it a democracy scare. And uh, it, anyhow, the images from this democracy scare in 1896 are incredible. And they invented the sort of establishment of that time, invented a meaning for the word populist, uh, populism. They, they came up with a stereotype of populism. And it, it was completely false. It was political, right? It was an effort to defeat populism. So they called it all sorts of names, including racist names, right? And uh, that... That stereotype survives to this day. But here's the real twist in the story. It's no longer just, you know, uh, people on the extreme. So in the 1890s, the people who hated populism were on the on the right. 
This was the establishment, the economists, the uh, rich people, the you know bankers, uh, who the you know the the established order who were defending themselves from what they saw as a radical onslaught. Today, the people who use this exact same stereotype, and I mean it's identical, these are liberals now. That's the that's what just blows my mind about it. That anti-populism has gone from right to left, but it's the same ideology. You know this idea that 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 good government and reason and order are threatened or what we would call norms are threatened by mass movements of the by an uprising of the common people of people who have of deplorables people who have no business uh ruling have no business making any decisions it's the exact well, same and and what fascinates me is uh, uh i mean i would have if I didn't know better, uh, thought you made some of these quotes up. They're so <laughs> comically extreme. They're so outrageous. You, you mean the ones from, from recent, from the last few years? Well, uh, Jonathan Rausch, senior yeah. fellow at Brookings, contributing editor to The Atlantic, quote, our most pressing political problem today is that the country abandoned the establishment, not the other way around. You know, you they, and they say things like that. They say things like that all the time. There are, I give I give I, maybe four or five or six examples in the book. There are hundreds more, <laughs> Richard. It's uh, this attitude is all over the place. The establishment must be defended from uh, the ignorant, the ignorant population. It's, right. it's, it is precisely the, the, the same. I mean, it's not the same words, but it's precisely the same argument made by defenders of the gold standard in 1896. Yasha Mao, populism is a disease. William Galston, populists damage democracy as such. Tony Blair uh, Institute, populist, quote, can pose a real threat to democracy itself. Populists. Because, because populists are, are, you know, the unit. You, Universal suffrage. Everybody has a vote. Everybody has a say. Everybody's voice counts. Right. That's a threat. <laughs> right. I mean, it's Orwellian. I hate to use that, that phrase because it's overused. But when you say that populists or when they say rather that populists uh, are a threat to democracy, what they're basically saying is the rule of the majority is a threat. Appealing to the majority is a threat to democracy. Now, uh, uh, the, well, okay. the, it's, a, it's a little it's a it's slight. Uh, it's slightly more than that. So populism appeals, you know, they never did win. They were a movement that, right. that loved the people and loved majorities and all that sort of thing. But they never did uh, prevail. They got beaten down. You know, the, the Republicans in the right wing of the day were successful in destroying populism. And I will talk about that in a minute, I'm sure. But okay. uh, what they imagined specifically was working people coming together uh to uh, you know to to for a program of economic democracy, you know to make the make the make the economy uh, something that we all had a say in, rather than just as employees or as farmers who you know have to plead with bankers to give them a you know to give them a break or something like that. And that's a powerful idea. That's what in other countries they call social democracy. This was an effort to start a a, a labor party, a social democratic party in America, and it, it they crushed it. And the people who crush it, their arguments are still going. <laughs> it's a, like I, I say in the book, it's a 19th century smear campaign that is somehow still going. Well, but one of the things that, that, that I wrestle with, Thomas Frank, and again, we're talking with Thomas Frank, author of a new book, The People, Come on, No. Um, one of the things that I struggle with is, I mean, I could craft our arguments on behalf of the oligarchs, if you want to use that term. Uh, going back to the 19th century, I could say that the economy is too complex and fast moving for the democratic process or e under the system, uh, even though you see inequality, it works out better than others. I mean, you know, you can imagine arguments, sure. but to literally you have say, to leave it up to the to ha you have to leave it up to the experts. They, that's what they said in the 19th century. It, the idea of farm. Farmers having a say over uh, the banking system. They, they laughed at this. This was a joke. Uh, and people say the exact same thing today. There was a book that came out uh, last year uh, by a comedian. And, uh, and he, was, he was laughing at the idea that there should be, that farmers should be represented at the Federal Reserve. 
This is a liberal. Who is the, the way. comedian? Oh, what's his name? Um, uh, he writes for Time Magazine. Um, sorry, he's a. a, a I'm sorry, I've forgotten his name. I, I really suck, don't I? Um, no, well, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't generalize from a single Joe, incident. Joel Stein like was his name. It was a book that came off, came out last year. Liberal humorist Joel oh, Stein oh. about about, and he, 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 he this was a punchline because Bernie Sanders had suggested or something that farmers should be that farm interests should be represented on the at the Federal Reserve, which is really not very far fetched, you know. And this guy made it tried to make a joke out of that. He thought that was and it's it's exactly the same thing that they laughed at that you know the. Rockefellers and the Morgans and so on, the robber barons laughed at in the 1890s. So when they say that populism is a threat to democracy, which they said then and they say now, as I understand it, uh, what they mean by democracy isn't necessarily what you or I or a a lot of people would mean by democracy, right? Because we think of democracy as being People vote, uh, they decide uh, what they want to do, and then they do it. And uh, I think what they mean by democracy must be something else. What is it? They mean rule by they themselves. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the democratic system, as they imagine it, is a system in which they are uh, the ruling class, the ruling elite. So there's a the, the great, the really... Um, critical inflection point in this history, and this, this is, a, of course, a work of history, um, comes in the 1950s when you had this new generation of academics coming up. It's not, look, somebody's trying to call me. They know I'm on your show. They're like, they're trying to phone me. There's this new generation of, of scholars coming up in academia. They called themselves the consensus intellectuals. And the, their whole idea was that this new generation generation, you know, where they were uh, all of a sudden the American corporation was hiring instead of, you know, hiring um, the sons of, 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 of rich people, they were hiring people with PhDs and the government was bringing in people with PhDs. And this whole prof- new professional class was running everything from the Pentagon to, you know, uh, Department of Agriculture. And so there was this kind of generation, there was a series of these generational manifestos written by the consensus intellectuals in which they trumpeted their own rise to power. You know, you remember Daniel Bell? Uh, of what is course. It? What is, yeah. What, come yeah. on. What's the title of the book? Uh, uh, not Beyond Left and Right. It's uh, The uh, End of, the end of ide- uh, ide- uh, end Ideology. ideology. Good. Yeah, Did the I end pass of the ideology. test? But the, yeah. Yes. But that's the, the whole idea of the consensus is that if you just let talented people, meaning they themselves, themselves, if you just let talented people like us run everything, we'll solve all the problems. You don't need mass movements. You don't need popular participation. In fact, you want to avoid those things. You, you want this sort of uh, professional elite sitting around a big mahogany table in Washington, D.C. and deciding everything amongst themselves. And I am not exaggerating. That was their sort of generational. Uh, uh, that was the vision uh, uh, that was sort of bequeathed to them, that was handed down to them, and they all uh, agreed in this. And then they they had to come up with a name for what they were displacing, for the sort of model that they were displacing, the, the thing that, that was not them, the opposite of their, of their idea of this sort of beyond uh, ideology, the end of ideology, right? What's, what's the opposite of that? When the word they came up with to describe that was populism. And mm. it had very little to do with the, uh, with the historical populist movement. It had a little bit to do with it. But, but, but by and large, they, a lot of them didn't even know what that movement was. Um, uh, some of them did. We'll talk about that later, I suppose. But by and large, they had no idea what that was. They just they used the word to describe the folly of mass movements. You can't trust mass movements. They won't. Uh, they're they're racist. They're uh, paranoid. They're psychologically damaged, and they they don't get results. And that's how they understood populism. Whether uh, and and by the way, their I, I, their understanding of populism didn't come from populism itself. It came from the people who hated populism. That's where they right. got. That's well, where that's- they got the. It's the ideology, and these were, isn't it? And, by the way, these were these were liberals. These were liberals who 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 uh, wrote these books. And know, among Daniel. them was uh, among them, I believe, uh, in this group. I guess you would include Richard Hofstadter, the historian who well, wrote the said, yeah. style in American he's, politics. He's the main one. So he's the main figure in this transition. And Hofstadter was uh, a great historian. When I was younger, I really admired him. Uh, wonderful writer. <laughs> 
anyhow, but now as an adult, I look back at his work. So he wrote a book in 1955 called uh, The Age of Reform, and it was a takedown of populism, and it won the Pulitzer Prize. This is the one where he said populism was anti-Semitic. Populism was uh, psychologically uh, unfit. These were people who, uh, because they were poor and on farmers who were on their way down, that they had status resentment, which is a form of you know a psych uh, you know the, the, a psychological disorder. So basically, you can't have a movement uh, in which people who are who are on their way down um, try to try to get their way over the rest of society, try to pass laws, try to elect candidates. You can't have that uh, because there's something wrong with them psychologically, which is a really bizarre thing for a liberal to say. Nevertheless, that was his argument. And uh, Hofstadter made this argument. The book was a monster hit, best-selling book, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, has been described as one of the most influential, the most influential work of history in the 20th century. And then five years, but within five years, was completely refuted by the historical uh, profession. All these other historians who actually knew something about populism them just dogpiled on on this book and uh, you know just tore it apart and disproved every little bit of it but here's the thing Richard Hofstadter's stereotype of populism which he draws completely without attribution from the sort of 1890s opponents of populism Hofstadter's uh, depiction of populism survives okay nobody remembers that it was refuted nobody remembers all the historians who wrote uh, articles in, in um, you know, history journals and books and so on, academic uh, books refuting Hofstadter. Nobody remembers that. There was this, like I say, it was an outpouring of this stuff. And uh, but his stereotype of populism that survives. Uh, and so, this is what I this is what I always say. I'm sorry to, if I'm talking too much. Let me know. But I want to. No, 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 that's okay. But I, I just uh, I have a question, though, or an out of thought. And uh, and obviously you do bring the narrative of the book up to the present day or the, uh, the present day as it existed when you last, you know, marked your galleys or whatever. But um, and it's this. That was in, uh, in February. From, <laughs> from, yeah, OK. From from the economists of the 19th century through the Bell uh, Hofstadter crowd of the 50s through today. Day. I would say there, I one of the characteristics of anti. I, I'll pick the fifties as an example. One of the characteristics that uh, or uh, beliefs that that group seemed to reflect and, and promulgate was this kind of naive belief that you could have such a thing as a technocracy that it was actually possible for disinterested, objective, and high-minded individuals of the nineteen. 50s to feed their punch cards into the univac computer or whatever and get back a printout of how society should be run which is a, of itself such a deeply ideological position yes and an so artifact wrong. of a it's culture so, just also just shattered by reality i mean within right. 10 years like the vietnam war is their great monument they're going to run this war with a computer remember but robert mcnamara sitting there in the pentagon you know, running the Vietnam War with the Univac computer, and it, it, it's it, it's a it's a catastrophe. The, this this vision of a technocracy, of a society uh, uh, run by these uh, you know professional elites who are supposedly disinterested, but in reality turn out never to be. They always act in their own class interest. Always, you know, it fails yeah. and fails and fails and fails. It, it I mean, and it fails right up to the present day. Uh, I mean, we're living through one of its these, you know, the this uh, the coronavirus is is this catastrophic failure of that system. The uh, bank bailouts and the Obama years, another failure. The maybe one of the biggest failures is the Hillary Clinton presidential campaign that is run by the best consultants, the best political scientists in America. And they fucked it up. Oh, I can't say That's that. OK. Troy, take a note to bleep them. Uh, OK, um, but they, so they screw things again and again and again and again by the way and this is always left out of all of this literature is the the fact of elite failure okay elite failures happen all the time and th so this whole anti-populist literature never mentions that so that that's completely impossible elite failure what do you mean that could never happen you need to put the elites in charge and then everything is going to be you know then everything is going to be great one more thing uh, this okay. is a point that I that I I 
want to make so badly if I could get the world to listen, which is, of course, a problem these days, Richard. But <laughs> as, as you mentioned at the top of the show, you were reading those, those quotes. There is today a whole academic discipline of populism studies. They call it global populism studies. And it is entirely based on the Richard Hofstadter thesis, on Richard Hofstadter's vision. And they never acknowledge that his vision was refuted. It's all, ba this is an entire academic discipline that is based on a famous, a notorious mistake back in the 1950s, a mistake. And well, it's this like, these people are in charge, you know, all over the place. And their entire pedagogy is based on an error. And this gets to a point uh, that I, I, I've been making for a long time and was deeply reinforced by reading your book. And again, the book is the the people common no by Thomas Frank, uh, but uh, the point that, to me anti populism and the people who promulgate it, it's essentially an anthrop a study in anthropology to me. It's a small group of people. You could call it a tribe if that's not you know culturally insensitive or whatever. But it's a small group of people with their own folkways, their own beliefs. Uh, their own self-reinforcing, uh, you know, if a, a strange and they are ship comes in, utterly, into utterly impervious to utterly impervious to outside criticism. As with many professional groups, they simply they uh, they don't listen to outside criticism. Can I give you a uh, well? I, I don't know if I'm allowed to use this example, but I'll I'll put it in a neutral way. Uh, one of the leading historical author uh, historians who was an authority on pop. Populism. And I mean, uh, there was no greater authority on, on populism. He died a few years ago. I was talking to friends of his who knew him pretty well. And I said, did he ever get invited to these conferences that these anti-populist people have? You know, they're all over the place in Europe. They happen in America all the time. Did they ever invite this guy? He was, after all, the world's foremost authority on populism. And you know what the answer was? What? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> no, they don't invite him. No. So, and the reason they didn't invite him is because he didn't. Uh, it's a, he, he it's a conch, their definitely. orthodoxy. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, to me. Uh, I don't, well, I don't, actually, you know what? I, uh, let's change gears a little bit, uh, Thomas Frank, and let's talk about uh, you, you know, for example, you explore the candidacy of William Jennings Bryan. Uh, who was, uh, if not, although not, I guess, a member of the Populist Party, he ran, you know, on a close, uh, close enough. They endorsed him, you know. Yeah. So. And but he was on a, a, a he was on a pop a major party platform and so on. I uh, didn't succeed, and uh, a pro, pro, I guess the high water mark for populism in the nineteenth century. I would say, I guess, but uh, one of the things that perhaps defeated Brian. And also, I think, defeated Bernie Sanders, who I worked for, and have defeated some other candidates of a populist ilk uh, along the way, is uh, that while the anti-populism is an elite phenomenon, what it communicates to the people and what gets out to the public at large is, you may like these ideas, but we're the experts and it will ruin everything. So, so the people yep. may not vote for populism, but the takeaway to me is not the people don't want what populists want. The takeaway is that the people have been convinced by elites that populism, which is what they want, can never succeed. I mean, as elaborate uh, yes, laying out of a question. Yes, uh, or, or, or that it's evil or that it's, uh, you know, it represents right. something uh, dangerous and scary and... Uh, so there was what happened was Brian got nominated William Jennings Bryan. He was 36 years old, nominated by the Democratic Party as their presidential candidate uh, in place of Grover Cleveland, who was the sitting president of the United States. The party threw Cleveland overboard and, and nominated Brian and Brian's the main, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, candidate. Campaign promise he ran on was to do away with the gold standard, replace it with what they called free silver. And uh, this is hard for people to understand today. But just to make a long story short, Brian was by today's, uh, you know, according to today's sort of economic thinking, Brian was much closer to being right than the 
supporters of the gold standard, who was the Republican Party of the day. Uh, and um, right. anyhow, so Brian goes out there with this, you know, promising to go to war against the gold standard. And he's cross endorsed by the populist party. That's a huge gamble for them. Very controversial, but they do it. They get on board with Brian and he goes out there and is buried in the most incredible, uh, uh political onslaught that this country has probably ever seen. Uh, the Republican party nominates William McKinley, a staunch supporter of the gold standard, a protectionist, uh, and McKinley, <clears throat> turns to his right-hand man, who's this Cleveland tycoon named Mark Hanna. Do you know this story? You remember this story? I it's, read it in the book, a, yeah. I, 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 wish our, I wish people of our time were familiar with this story. Mark Hanna uh, raised the what is, by some standards of measurement, the largest war chest ever for a presidential uh, election, if you, if you measure it in in per capita terms, the size of uh, versus the size of the economy. He actually at one point went door to door to the Fortune 500 headquarters in Manhattan, you know, going around in his in his horse, in his carriage, right, uh, saying to them, OK, I'm the representative of the Republican candidate. Open your books. And they did it. And he said, we're taking, you know, X percentage of, of last year's profits for the for the McKinley campaign. And they did it. They wrote him that check and they proceeded to annihilate Brian. Now, Brian had no money whatsoever. He actually, the, the, what his campaign consisted of, he was a kind of a novelty. He was this amazing, uh, he had this amazing sort of oratorical gift. And so what the campaign consisted of was one guy, the presidential candidate going around the country in a train, you know, whistle stop tour and speaking from the back of the train. That was it. He carried his own bags. <laughs> He'd have to change. He rode in day in uh, what they call day coaches. He had to like sleep in train stations. <laughs> you know, it's like, and here comes, you know, McKinley and Mark Hanna and they have feel, they feel, a whole, you know, like a, a whole group of of uh, counter or or you know counter speakers, right? Who follow Brian around the country? You know, like twenty of them. They follow Brian around the country, giving all these free speeches, denouncing him. They cover the country in pamphlets. Uh, they, you know, and then all these cartoons in the newspapers, all of these attacks on populism, all of them with this tone of hysteria. OK, that this was the this was the uh, the greatest calamity America has ever faced. This was anarchy. This was repudiation. This was a riot. They called it free riot. Uh, this was, <clears throat> you know, the lazy and the shiftless. This was the working class trying to take, take over when they have no business doing that. And the word that they used to characterize Brian was populism. That was that's how they uh, attacked him. They they used that word uh, and made that word into the kind of curse word that it still is today. Uh, and so all of our modern day anti-populism really traces itself back to this incredibly corrupt uh, right wing campaign in 1896. And I have a really good time in the book quoting from the ephemera from that campaign, which are just the, the most, uh, inc you know, it's just the most hysterical kind of statements, by the way. So I, I put a gallery of them up on my website, on tcfrank.com. If you go to tcfrank.com, there's a gallery of sort of ephemera from this 1896 campaign that are just outrageous. They will they will shock you that this stuff was uh, used in a, uh, well, anyhow, you'll see. No, I know, and and uh, it is fascinating. And, and Thomas Frank, you know, one of the things that you address in this book and it really gets overlooked in when we think about populism or left wing movements, popular movements and all that is. Uh, and it was fun because I was actually alive and uh, politically aware teenager at the time was the relationship. And by the way, I got beaten up by uh, hard hats at the peace demonstration. So was uh, oh, the relationship you were there. You were there. I was beaten up once, yeah. And wow. um, it, I think it would have been about 1970, maybe, or 69. I would have been about 15. Right. And um, may not have that's, been. That's I wasn't at the one you're thinking far. of, which I think was the one in, uh, Grand, uh, was it Grand Central Station or someplace? But, uh, it was somewhere in New York, somewhere, I think, lower Manhattan. Yeah, yeah. There were a number of them. But at any rate, um what I wanted to get at was uh, you quoted uh, the Greening of America, which was, as you say, the big counterculture think book of 1970. Um, you basically, you know, the sort of 
uh, hippie consciousness book, for lack of a better word, describing quote unquote blue collar workers as quote. Right. But, but wait, wait, arch- written, by, written by a professor at Yale Law School. Yes, the great the great book about hippie consciousness, but written by a professor. I right. love that detail. Written by a professor. Right. At no, Yale it is Law a great School. detail, but very popular. <laughs> Um, yeah. describe as describe blue collar workers as quote those arch opponents of the new consciousness. In other words, instead of any sense, I mean, there were uh, left wing radicals who had uh, working class sensibilities and tried to work with the working class. And, you know, Tom Hayden and either yeah. Black Panthers reach out to working yeah. class people. But but this sort of apposition. well, this is when it all comes apart, Richard. This is when yeah. you know well, this tell is us when all about the. Yeah. Tell oh, us well, that's the that's the that's both the period that that period has fascinated me for my entire life. I was five <laughs> when that stuff went on. And uh, I, I can't say I was politically conscious, but uh, I knew what was going on. I mean, it's hard to miss Archie Bunker. Right. I watched that show. Right. Everybody did. And uh, the the general argument that these people made was that working class, they would use the term working class people. What they meant was was white working class people. And specifically, union members were the new uh, reactionary enemy, and they right. more or less openly said this. The and the, the probably the the example that will um, that that will everybody will remember is the ending of uh, Easy Rider, where right. the two heroes are you know they have this it's this very glamorous movie. These two guys on this very romantic uh, motorcycle adventure, and they're driving through like Louisiana or somewhere, and some. Uh, you know, basically uh, stereotype rednecks in a pickup truck, shoot them dead for no reason at all. Right. Just this random uh, act of violence. And uh, one of the historians that I'm that I'm really fond of uh, watching this said, oh, my God, it's a it's the Jodes. It's the people at the very end of the Grapes of Wrath. So, you know, they're, they're one movie is quoting right, from the other right. only with instead of them being this, the Jodes being the salt of the earth, you know, Ma Jodes saying we're we're the people we keep becoming you know right, right. Uh, wherever the there's folks that movie, up a guy movie, they're 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 out wherever there they're... murdering murdering fun they're murdering good times they're murdering you know this new expanded consciousness and that's that that's what happens in the late 60s and we're still that was what by the way listen liberal was about this to a great degree and uh you know we all argue you know the argument has long been well working people are to blame uh, especially the white working class, you know, they betrayed the Democratic coalition and they supported the war in Vietnam. But actually, that's not exactly right. And if you look at it uh, very carefully, the Democratic Party turned and the the sort of new consciousness culture turned against these people even before that. I mean, the whole uh, uh, new left, the white new left anyway, was uh, in love with the idea that uh, uh, the new revolutionary class was students that the working class was out of it and right. you didn't have to worry about the working class anymore. That was, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it was the left turning their backs on uh, working class movements that, that caused this whole thing. And by, we're still living with that today. We still have not got around that. The Democratic Party has no intention of going back uh, and sort of retracing its steps and uh, building bridges back to uh to to you know to movements of the working class they're still in love with the idea of the professional class the highly educated as as the real uh you know uh, uh bearers of reform and so interestingly that's, enough that's, in some ways, that's the end of populism that's really where it dies i mean people try right. to revive it but and, and and interestingly enough i think uh you know the student debt problem uh falls under that too this long-held belief that the way to uh, the way to uh, ha- take care of the working class is by making all of them no longer their working class by eliminating it <laughs> through know. education, right? Yeah, so everybody, every- gets, everybody gets a, a bachelor's degree, right? That'll solve everything. Everybody gets to take the SAT, Richard. Everybody, we're gonna, we're not gonna, we're gonna let every single person take the SAT. There you go. You know, everybody gets to participate in the meritocracy, and and. It, it's just it misses the point, you know, it misses the point of populism altogether, which is that you've got to have a system that allows small farmers to do what they do and make a living at it. You know, you're never going to do away with these people or this class of people. We have done away with small farmers in this country, but you're always going to have a working class. It's just like that is what a society is. 
And uh, the, the, the answer to them is to not to say, OK, you can all join in the uh, the white collar race now, you know, the race to the top or whatever the hell it, hell it was, uh, Obama's slogan. No, the answer is universal health care, you know, a, a good minimum wage. Age, labor unions, you know, make their lives middle class lives as well. It, we know that's what this country used to be. Anyhow, I get really worked up talking about this stuff. And uh, well, I'm shut. Well, no, no, you should. Uh, you should get worked up about it, because I think in a lot of ways, you know, we the, the singular horribleness of uh is that a proper noun? Horribleness? I, I want to say horribility. Horribleness. <laughs> the yeah. singular horror of Donald Trump uh, distracts people from the fact this may be the uh, the main front in the war for a better politics. It is this, this battle between populism and anti-populism, not the battle between the orange man and everybody else, which I, I many... Know. And, and by the way, I'm... I, I, uh, yeah. And that's we are so utterly, you know, in love with this war. I mean, look at The Washington Post e every day. You go on The Washington Post website and they have their, you know, their their top five op eds or whatever. Every single one of them is about Trump. Every single one. Uh, always, you know, attacking him in some, you know, clever or not so clever kind of banal way. Always. And uh, we can't see around this the, the, the horror of Trump to understand that we're in this larger historical stream and in the grand scheme of things, we're getting it wrong. So I said, Richard, I may have said it to you even when Trump first got elected that, you know, Trump is a singularly awful uh, president and a, a kind of a terrible man and, you know, blah, 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 blah. You, you know, the, the, the routine, you've heard it a million times, but anti-Trumpism is is really interesting because it's also right. really misguided. It's, 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 it's very misguided. It, 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 it uh, you know, it despairs of ever bringing back the uh, white working class. I mean, this is officially what they do, you know, that we, this, this can never be done. So we have to basically double down on the, 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 the democratic strategy of all these years, which is reaching out to the professional class, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, the possibility, the prospect for real populism, uh, you know, as in as you see with a character like Bernie Sanders, who Bar Bernie Sanders is as close to the populist tradition as it's possible to be nowadays, uh, that just gets uh, sort of shuffled aside. You know, the Democrats are determined to go on in this way. And what they don't understand is as they blow this stuff off and as they ignore people's legitimate uh, economic concerns, uh, this is just going to go on and on and on and on. And they may beat Trump this fall. I actually think they have an extremely good chance of beating him. I'd be really surprised if, if Biden lost uh, at this point. I mean, who the hell knows three months from now? But uh, that won't make any difference. The Republicans are just going to regroup with a different asshole, you know, and the, 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 the same the same. Uh, fatuous message and the Republic and, and the Democrats are going to be caught flat footed again. And this is going to go on and on and on until the day the Democrats understand where they came from until they go back and read about Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, William Jennings, Bryan, and understand where they came from. By the way, I do have one. There is one for me, one spot of, of real hope on the horizon right now, which is, Black Lives Matter. Sure. Think about that. Think about that name. It is it is in some ways it is a perfect populist slogan. I mean, it is utterly uh, populist um, and it's not uh, now the movement is not there yet. It's not it's not you know, it's very democratic, et cetera. But it's mainly concerned with police brutality. It hasn't sort of turned the corner and gone into economic issues yet, but it might. And if but it it's does, touching on them, it's calling for health care for everyone us. and a job for everyone. And if you look you at, and, and really over time, but, but I guess this will be my closing thought and then I'll let you have your closing thought. But if you look, I was writing about this last night for something. If you look at uh, the, the powerful movements of the last 10 years, Occupy Wall Street, the Women's March, Black Lives Matter, the one thing they all have in common, one of the things they all have in common is no elite leadership. 
they they sprung up from the periphery of you know uh, the elite world or or in the empire, uh, not from the heart of it. And that to me is deeply encouraging. That's my closing thought. Yes, no, that, that's that's actually that's actually really uh, really important. Uh, what uh, my closing thought? Jeez. Well, you know, I th- you know what I think. You know that I think the populist tradition is important. And I am absolutely fascinated by anti-populism. And we are all, uh, all of us, so many, I should say not all, but so many of us liberals are locked into this anti-populist mentality and we can't see our way clear from it. And the one thing that I, I mean, I just, I have to remind your viewers of, which we did not talk about, is there is this uh, uh, sort of obsessive concern or belief, I should say, among good liberal people that Populism in some way means racism. And I just want to assure <laughs> right. them that that, is, that that is not the case. I mean, so many people, when they think about populism, they're just immediately derailed by this, uh, that, this, uh, this belief that it must, that it's a bigoted uh, a way of thinking. And it's, it's not that at all. At the time, it was the opposite. In the 1890s, it was the opposite of that. And if you look at the various examples of it, as I show it sort of coming up again and again in American history, it's the opposite of that. Populism is, you know, Everybody all together against, uh, you know, against this elitist uh, economic system. And you have these you know, great movements in the uh, in the 1930s and in the 1960s where that was their vision. Let's get blacks and whites together uh, to fight against, you know, this uh, this this unregulated capitalist system. And that's what we've got to have. That is, as one of my friends was saying the other day, that is the holy grail. When you get that, you win. We know that for sure. And it's just, uh, you know, let's do it. That's, let's that's do my it. Closing. Yeah. All right. Where do I sign? Again, my guest is Thomas Frank. His new book is The People, comma, No, N-O, uh, A Brief History of Anti-Populism. His previous works have included What's the Matter with Kansas and Listen Liberal. And as always, Tom Frank, great talking with you. Richard, it's my pleasure. And we'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escow, and you're listening to The Zero Hour.